welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. My name is Pastor Paul Ogando, and I'm the pastor of our Spanish ministry, Iglesia La Roca. And so it is a privilege for me to do this every uh, Sunday. We've been going at it almost six years now in June, and it's been an amazing blessing. My wife and I, who's sitting there at the front too, next Pastor Jessica, she is a partner in ministry with me. Um, she leads worship every Sunday. I preach just about every Sunday, so we're always there working, advancing, because we believe in the heart. Pastor Jim and Deborah have a heart for the, for the Hispanic around our area, and so we jumped on that desire they had in their hearts to advance the kingdom of God and the Spanish-speaking people in our area, and it's a, it's a kingdom thing, okay? It is not about my, my preference or your preference, but it's a kingdom thing, so we're so excited to be able to do that. That's who I am. Let's get into the Word of God. Is that, is that good with you? All right, last week we started something called Love God, Love People. And Pastor Luke did an, an amazing introduction to this sermon. Please get the CD or go online completely free, uh, rockchurch.com, and you can get that. Uh, I just want to mention uh, the things he went over. To love God, he mentioned five things. Number one is to honor God. Number two is to revere and fear God. Number three is to submit to God. He said to love God is to seek God or go after him. And number five is to represent God, meaning wherever we go, whatever we do, we represent God. And so he covered those five things and did an amazing exposition of it. So I recommend that you do get that CD so you can keep tracking with us. So here's where we're at. Basically, Jesus, in a conversation uh, with some guys who wanted to trip him up called Pharisees, they say, hey, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? I mean, you're the teacher of the law. You should know this. And Jesus wisely said, listen, it is to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all you have in you. But Jesus didn't stop there. Without breathing, he says, and the next one is just as important and as great, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what happens is that Jesus explains that to give us a context, an idea of what, what we should understand about love. But here's the problem. The English language, as many languages that are very direct and um, in their expression, love is just one word. We say, I love my wife, but we also say, I love pizza. So, so love is kind of like mixed with everything else. But in the Greek language and in many other languages, who come from Latin uh, descendant, there is a mix. There's not one word. It was the same with Greek. And there's three expressions. I'm not going to tell you Greek, but you probably heard them. Agape love, phileo love, that's where we get Philadelphia, brotherly love, okay? And eros, that's where we get our loving relationship between husband and wife, okay? And so if those three definitions, agape is more the friendly, more the usually used in a context of church. So when you read the word love in the Bible, you kind of have to find out what they're referring to because they're not saying, I love pizza and I love my wife. They're meaning two completely different things. And many times when we read a verse like that that says, oh, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Oh, yeah, you got to love him. We're thinking, well, I love pizza, so if tonight I don't feel like pizza, I don't feel like loving God. Unless we understand what the word is trying to communicate back to us. Are you with me so far? It's very important that we look at that emphasis, how they brought it. First John 4, 19, I'll just put it up for you because I just want to mention it. it. says a very interesting thing. He says, we love him because he first loved what? We love him because he first loved us. So how is it possible that God is asking you or I to love him above everything else when it says that he, we love him just because he loved us first? See, we are not the initiators of love. Love doesn't start with us. I'm not the one who says, oh, I love God so much that I've begun this relationship and I'm pushing forward into loving God. Absolutely not. Actually, God initiated love towards us. Therefore, our respond back to him is, I want to love you. I want to love God above all else and anything else in my life. And therefore, I represent that love. God, when they were going into the promised land, did something so interesting. He reaffirmed his covenant with them. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, he says, listen, even if you're far away, I'm going to bring you back. But you have to be willing to ask forgiveness so that I can return you back to your land. And then he says something so interesting. Look at it with me. He says, and the Lord your God, this is God speaking through uh, Moses, through, through his people before they go in. And, and Joshua and them. It says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants for what? 
to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Just in the previous verse, God says, I put before you life and death, choose life. But he said something so interesting. It took me a few times to read it and someone else kind of to talk it over with me. See that? It says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. It's a weird expression. We don't understand it. Most of us know what circumcision in is in the flesh. But God is saying, I'm going to remove what is wrong in the flesh of your heart so that you may love me. Meaning God is the initiator of love. You cannot love him. I cannot love him unless he removes from us the things that keep us separated from what he wants to bring into our lives. So when you hear an expression, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, it cannot happen until he actually removes it. So he initiates love. We would only love him because he already did that for us. How? You and I know he sent his son. He died for us. He has continually pursued us to bring us back to him. Are you with me so far? And so God is doing that for us. He's trying to connect once again with us and bring us back. So he'll remove those things from our life. I just want to cover two expressions in what we did tonight. Number one, to love God. To love God. To love God is to stay in relationship with him. I'll repeat that. To love God is to stay in relationship with him. Let me put it to you this way so you can understand mostly on an earthly uh, relationship the way you and I represent. Many times in the word of God, I was teaching about that t today in our Spanish service. In the word of God, a marriage relationship is also represented many times as the relationship of God and the church. You and I are the bride of Christ. Are you with me? So we're waiting for his return so that we can be together. In the same manner, to love God is to stay in relationship with him. Meaning, I made a commitment with him, and I'm going to continue on that commitment. I don't tell my wife, hey, I love you, put a ring on her finger, and take a hike. I didn't do that. And so God is saying, don't do that with me. If you love me, you stay in relationship with me. We stay connected. We continue to move past our disagreements, our issues, our problems, our misunderstanding. We continue to push through, but we stay in relationship. See, what tends to happen is most of us see the relationship. We don't see the results sparking right away. Or we get really excited at first, just like marriage, things are great. Six months into it, problem starts to happen. And so you think, man, is this the right woman? Is this the right guy? My mom told me I should have listened to that lady. You know, and so it goes on and on, you know, know how it goes. In the same manner, we go with the church. We go, man, I mean, I did this, the pastor, I pray, but I'm not sure. But to love God, I want you to know something. To love God is to stay in relationship with him. Don't walk away. Don't run. Don't skate. Just stay. Just stay long enough to connect with God. In my own walk with God, I was telling my wife, and, uh, you know, I've been in the church most of my life, but there was moments where it became a routine. It became something I did. I went to church with my mom. I did this thing. And so many times I wasn't necessarily in relationship with God. But God asked me something when I was working on this message. I said, Lord, I'm not sure I, I, how do I approach the to love God aspect? I'm not sure how to preach this message. I'm trying to get something from you. I felt the Spirit ask me a question. How have you love me. And I just told God, I've just stayed. I've been here. I've gone nowhere. And to love God is to stay in relationship with him. If there's only one thing you get tonight is do not run from your commitment to God. And in return, you're telling him, I love you. I'm willing to stay. I'm willing to stay. There's a conversation between Peter and Jesus that's very interesting. Peter, as you guys know, it's a great disciple, one of the chosen few. He's also on the inner circle, one of the chosen three executive staff, if you can call it that way. I mean, this guy's in there. But Peter had issues. I mean, like all of us, you know. Peter was a guy that one day was super spiritual, the next day, not quite so, you know. One day, he's really into it, but the next day, the guy's running when his boss, master, friend, Gets in trouble, Peter's, forget you, man, it's not good for me, I'm, I'm out of here. 
So it didn't square for him. So this is where we find Peter. Peter's absolutely frustrated. Jesus has already resurrected. He died on the cross, resurrected, demonstrated his love physically, came and showed him by dying and resurrecting, goes before the disciples and shows himself, hey, I'm here, I'm alive, everybody, oh my goodness, it's great. But Peter's not quite convinced in his heart. Because Peter felt, man, this didn't work out for me. And so one day Peter's depressed next to his boat, which was his business, he was a fisherman, and tells his buddies, you know what? This thing didn't pan out the way I thought. We gave it three years, didn't work out. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going back to work. I'm going to do what I love and what I know, which is fishing. So he jumps in the boat. A few of his buddies say, hey, you're doing it and you're in the inner circle. We're jumping in with you. See what I'm saying? So they jump into this thing. Then Jesus shows up. They do a miraculous um, fishing. They grab tons of fish. They come out. Peter realizes it's Jesus and is absolutely humbled and starts a conversation with Jesus. That's very interesting. Let's read it. So Jesus makes them breakfast and said, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, talking about Peter, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He was talking about the fishes. And he was saying, do you love me more than these? Do you love me uh, more than being in your business? Do you love me more than being involved in what you know? Do you love me more than being secure in the things that you know you can control? Do you love me? The conversation continues, and he says, uh, he said to him, yes, Lord, I, you know that I love you, he said to him. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. The interesting thing, when I look at the word in, in, in the language of the Bible, the New Testament, Jesus says, Peter, do you phileo me, meaning are you interested in a true love for me? Are you willing to represent me? And Jesus said, sure, I agape you, meaning Jesus, you're my man. Let's leave it at that. You get what I'm saying, why it's important to look at these two languages? See, you would think Jesus is saying passionately, man, do you love me? And Peter's like, of course I love you. No, 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 no. Jesus is saying, Peter, do you love me? Jesus is saying, I love you, my man. What's going on? That's exactly what's going on. And so the conversation continued. Verse 16, he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep, meaning stay doing the work that I'm asking you to do. Verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Jesus is trying to get a point across not only to Peter, but to you and I tonight. And I want you to get it. So focus right now. So he says, do you love me? So Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. That conversation sounds great. Jesus is saying, man, do you love me? I know you messed up, but I want you to stay focused. Jump with me to verse 19, and this is what gripped my heart. So in this whole conversation they're talking, if you go to verse 19, chapter 21 says, Then he spoke, Jesus saying, signifying by what death he would glorify God, talking about Peter. And when he has spoken this, he said to him, what? Follow me. Say it with me. What? Follow me. I need you to get the picture. Here's what's going on. Peter betrays Jesus. Peter feels lousy. Jesus comes to life and goes to talk to none other than that guy, the guy who did it wrong. And he says, Peter, do you love me? I need you to do something for me. And Peter, sure, I love you. Why not? Peter, that's not what I'm asking. Do you love me? You know I do. I mean, we hung out. We're together three years. I love you. Then I need you to do something for me. Once again, Jesus goes, Peter, do you love me? Meaning, are you willing to invest part of your life and part of who you are, forget your security, and do something extra? And he said, of course I do. Then Jesus said to him, follow what? Follow me. You know what Jesus was saying? I know you messed up, man. I know it was terrible. I know you did wrong. But I just want one thing from you. I need you to stay with me. I need you to stay with me. See, because to love God is to stay in relationship with him. See, Peter's attitude is the attitude of many Christians nowadays in the church that said, if I can't be perfect, why bother being good? If I can't be perfect, why bother being good? God wants you to stay even if you don't feel perfect. 
Because he already knows you're not perfect. But if you don't even try to be good, then you're walking away from the love of God completely. And that is not what he wants from us. To love God is to stay in relationship with him. It's so important for us to get that. Just stay in relationship with him. Just continue to believe and continue to walk with him. See, many times what happens, what drives us away from the love of God, what drives us away from those things, in Matthew 24, 12, I'm taking a little liberty in my interpretation because this is really talking about the end times. But it says, sin will be rampant everywhere in the living translation, and the love of many would grow what? Oh, the five of you. Thank you so much. The love of many will what? Grow cold. You know what that means? That because of evil in our life, the love that we have ceases to be. So you want to ignite the love of God in your heart? Walk away from sin. Walk away from evil. Just walk away. Just say, I don't want to do this anymore. I can't be perfect, but I want to be good. And I'll work my way to perfection when he comes. I'm on, he's going to find me here when he returns. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because to love God is to stay in relationship with him. Very, very important. To love God is to remain constant in your relationship with God. Number two. So to love God is to stay in relationship with him. Number two. To love people. Are you ready? So to love God, love people. To love people is to push past discomfort. To push past discomfort. Push past discomfort. Listen, uh, you know, before I came to America, well, almost 11 years ago, to move to the United States of America, um, I remember dealing sometimes with friends that was from the States. And our, what do you call it in this country, our private space? Yeah? Is that what you call it? It's very personal space. Thank you, Pastor Sue. Personal space is very different. See, people stand up here, and this is a conversation right here. You're there, here. But in my country, man, it's right here. You know, hey, what's going on? And there's nothing wrong. We're just there. You know, we're, we're, it's absolutely close, and it's okay. Most of you would be like, hey, back off, man. What are you doing? You know? But to push past discomfort means I'm going to get into a little bit of somebody's personal space in order to reach where they're at in their heart and in our conversation and in our contact. And that's what Jesus was saying. Hey, love your neighbor as yourself. The way you love yourself, you feed yourself, you take care of yourself, you clothe yourself. Think in that same aspect of someone else. Think in that same area of someone else. You push past discomfort. I have a neighbor. I love my neighbor. His name is Alan. And sometimes he watches online. I don't know if he's online now, but um, I love Alan. He's a, psych he's a psychologist, a great guy. But that guy has no, no, I mean, his comfort zone is enormous. I mean, he's comfortable with everybody. He'll go across the street and talk to new neighbors. He's always friendly with everybody. I mean, I'm a pastor, and I don't even do that. You know, I'm kind of private. This guy's everywhere. And so we're buddies, and so I love Alan. But Alan is great at pushing past discomfort. He pushes past it and talks to people, gets to know them. And it's amazing what he does. And it's been a really example for me in that area. He really pushes through. There's a story in the Bible. We talk about it all the time here. It's the story of Nicodemus in, cha in John chapter 3. But before you go there, I'm just going to mention what's going on. So here's Nicodemus. You've heard the story. Pastor Jim says it all the time. Some of our pastors. This guy's great. This guy's amazing. This guy's a teacher of the law according to the word of God. And so he comes and talks to Jesus at night because he didn't want his buddies to find out he was talking to Jesus. Because they were at odds with each other. You understand what I'm saying? They were from two completely different camps. Jesus came to push back on those religious limitations. And Nicodemus says, hey. Let's talk about the condition of our souls. What's going on? What's going on in our lives? So they're having this conversation. Now, I want you to pay attention to this. Jesus and Nicodemus, they weren't on the same playing field. They weren't even on the same ball game. Because the Sadducees and those guys hated Jesus. Hated Jesus. So Nicodemus feels something in his heart, apparently, to go talk to him about eternity. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, this is how eternity happens. And explains to him and says, hey, man. You must be born again. Meaning your spirit has to be restored in order for you to have a connection with God. In order for you to love God. But Jesus gives Nicodemus the greatest revelation of love the word of God ever had or has. And you know what it is. 
in a conversation with a man that he is at odds in his religious opinion, Jesus tells him, John 3, 16. And he says, Nicodemus, I want you to understand love, and this is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Would you read that with me so you get it in your soul? One, two, three. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus could have said, hey, man, you and I, we belong to two political parties that are completely different. As a matter of fact, you and I don't even belong from the same neighborhood. We don't roll together, so I'm not going to talk to you. You understand what I'm saying? Yet Jesus pushes past his comfort and said, I'm about to tell you the greatest revelation of love that has ever been in the Bible. And he told it to the guy he was at odds with in his theological understanding. That is pushing past discomfort. How about if you and I push past this comfort? May we have a great relationship? May God give us a great revelation with a friend from a different social status, color of the skin, or different neighborhood? Could he do that if I push past this comfort? Could I meet a great friend? Somebody who's going to be with me when things go down? Could that be the case if I push past this comfort? Are you with me so far? Or are you uncomfortable? If you're uncomfortable, maybe God's talking to you because I can't do that. God's going to do that. Here's the connection. Here's what I love. The same writer, John, writes a different book called 1 John. And he connects the greatest love revelation to our revelation. 1 John 3.16 says this. Let me have it on the overhead. For you and I says, but by, see, by this we know. Say, by this we know. So he's about to tell us what? By this we know love because he laid down his life for us, meaning Jesus, now comes a challenge, and we also, oh, man, that verse just got ruined right there. And we also had to lay down our lives for the brethren. John 3.16 tells me God loved me above all things. First John 3.16 tells me that the way he loved me, I have to love someone else. Because to love people is to push past discomfort. It is very important for us to understand that. Very important. Pastor Dan is a very friendly guy. Uh, but remembering this message, I remember my first day here, a job, Pastor Jim hired me to be here on staff. And I remember he saw me in the hallway. I was completely lost. It's like a maze back there in the office. I have no idea. He saw me. Hey, has anybody walked around? No. Hey, I mean, we had barely spoken uh, till then. I knew who he was. He had no idea who I was, so <laughs> I said, hey, yeah, sure. So he walked me around, showed me with an uh, office supply closet. It's very important if you're trying to write something, you can't find paper. So uh, he just walked me around, and I, I never forgot that experience because he pushed past discomfort. It was kind of weird. I'm a new guy in the office. He took the initiative to push past and reach out to me. Now, does that mean that Pastor Dan and I barbecue every Saturday, go to the river, run the boat? Actually, we have to be here in service on Saturday, so we don't do that for sure. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but we don't do that. We don't barbecue. We're not out. We hang out as friends uh, here in church and church activities many times. What am I saying? Loving people doesn't mean they have to become your best buddies. What people tend to do is, man, God is asking me to love people. Now i got to take this guy out for a Coke, and then we have to hang out. I mean, I don't want to do that. God is not asking you to do that. If that were to happen, that's phenomenal. What he's asking you is that you push past your comfort zone to reach into someone else's heart beyond who they are and what they represent. Very important. He did that, and he left us an example. By this we know. So God is trying to connect both, to love God and to love people. 1 John 5, 2 says the following. 1 John 5, 2 says, by this we know. Once again, first he said, by this we know love. By this we know that we love the children of God, meaning other people. How do we know that we love them? Are you ready? When we love God and keep his commandments. When we love God and keep his commandments. When you and I... Love, the initiator love, that eventually is going to represent our love for someone else. 
you're eventually going to push past your discomfort and say, man, God loved me. I'm weird, so therefore I got to love someone else. I got to reach into someone else's comfort zone and love them and connect with them and push past discomfort. And that's very, very important for you and I. Why? Because to love people, we have to love God. But we can love God unless we stay in relationship with God. Jesus said this, where the two greatest commandments, to love God with everything you've got and to love your neighbor as yourself. God spoke to you tonight. You give him a hand. Hey, listen, I want to make sure your heart is okay with God. And if you leave early, no ice cream for you. I'm just kidding. Um, I want to make sure that you're okay with God, that we want to love you, but we want to make sure the condition of your heart is right. Because if you come, have fun, uh, worship God with a few songs, those things are great. That's important to do. But if the condition of your soul is not right where it should be, then that's an eternal problem. See, an earthly problem is easy to solve. We just figure out a way to get it done, and it gets done. But an eternal problem, there's no solution for it unless you're here. I always have an expression I use because it's so important to me that you understand that every eternal decision is made while you're on earth. Once your time on earth has ended, there is no decision making. The power of decision making is removed from you. What am I saying tonight? That if you're going to make a decision to be with Christ, you have to do it now or you won't get a chance later. You don't know that. Our life is short. Some people make it 80 years, but some people may die just tonight. Many do. And that's a sad situation. And that's why all of us needs to assess the condition of our heart. Where am I with God? Where am I with God? Ask this question. If you were to die tonight, your life ends. Would you open your eyes in heaven or in hell? You answer that question in your heart. You don't have to tell your neighbor. Just check in your own self and say, where am I with God? Because I want to make sure you're okay with God. How do I do that? Here's Jesus talking to that man we talked about, Nicodemus. said, Nicodemus, you may know the word of God. I know you're a teacher of the law, meaning you know the first five books of the Bible. You've memorized scripture. But I want you to know that if you're going to make it into heaven the right way, you have to be born again. Born again is a terminology kind of weird because people make born again people kind of crazy. They carry their Bibles. They shout in supermarkets, which none of us do that, but for some reason they represent us that way. What Jesus was saying is your spirit has to be right with me. How do we do that? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, none, comes to the Father except by me. So if you want to make it to the Father, you have to go to Jesus. You have to go to Jesus. You have to make a decision tonight for that. But it says the condition of your heart even further. If you are lukewarm, the Bible says that he will vomit you from his mouth. Meaning he will push you out of the body of Christ. Because he wants you to be either hot or cold. Meaning don't play games with me. Don't play games with me. That's what Jesus is saying. You're in or you're out. He's clear. He wants you to be in. But if you're not in, that's your decision. What he doesn't want is for you to check in, throw a prayer to make sure that if something happens in the next few days, I'm good to go. That's, that's not how it works. See, to love God is to stay in relationship with him. To love God is that. So tonight I want to give you a chance to take his love and continue on in relation with him. How am I going to do that? In a moment, I'm going to count to three. Counting to three, I want you to pop your hands. I want you to go, that's me. I want to raise my hand. Why should you raise your hand tonight? Because you want to make sure that the condition of your heart is in the right place to meet God when your moment comes. You want to make sure of that. But pastor, why do we have to raise our hand? That's embarrassing. That's kind of weird. Yeah, maybe but here's what I want you to know. The Bible says that if you acknowledge him before man, meaning I'm a man, I'll see your hand, he will acknowledge you before the Father. He will say, hey, God, you see that one? You see that one? You see that one? That one is saying they want me. But in the same verse, it says, if you deny me, I will deny you. What is he saying? You don't want to be part of this? That's your decision. But if you want to be part of it, it's your decision also. Listen to this. To make it to heaven, you have to make a choice. To make it to hell, keep living the way you want. So to be with God, you make a choice tonight and you have an encounter with God. 
That's your decision. We've loved on God tonight. We talked about his love. We sang about him. But now is your time to say, I want him in my heart. I want to change the condition of my life. Who should raise their hands tonight when I count to three? Those who know in their heart, sitting right there tonight saying, Pastor, you're talking about me, and I want to change the condition of my heart tonight. Who should raise their hand tonight? Those who know in their heart that one day they did a prayer, but their commitment did not follow through with God. Reaffirm your commitment tonight. Who should raise their hand and give an opportunity to Jesus tonight? Those who know that the Spirit already talked to you right where you're at. I count to three. You raise your hand, and we'll pray together in this place, in this friendly, safe place place are you ready in your heart when I count to three one two and three is there anybody here in this place God bless you one two three four five thank you thank you you can put your hands out put your hands out there's five I see a hand over there where six thank you seven eight it's awesome you can put your hand down I didn't embarrass them I won't embarrass you nine thank you so much is there anyone else in this place saying Man, that's my turn. I better correct my direction with God this hour. This is your moment. We'll pray together and we'll commit our lives to God today. Is there anyone else in this place? This is your time. This is your turn. Is there anyone else? You know there's a number 10, but here's what I want to do. I'm going to pray with you in a moment. If you raise your hand, this is what I want you to do. I want you to grab your coat, your Bible, your purse, whatever you brought with you. Don't leave it in the seat. We're going to pray together right here. Number 10, I feel you out there. There's, you're struggling. This is your turn. Just raise your hand and we'll pray together. Is there anyone else in this place right now? You know it's your turn. Don't be hard-headed. Give a chance. Change your direction. Is there anyone else? All right. I'm still going to ask you in a moment, but what I want you to do, if you raise your hand, this is what I want you to do. I want you to meet me right here. We'll pray together. If you didn't raise your hand, but you should have, just meet me right here, and we'll pray together. So everybody, let's stand. Let's welcome them with a big clap because they're making a tremendous decision tonight. I want to meet you right here, and I want to pray with you tonight. Thank you, Lord. So it's so awesome to see you. You be brave. This is a tough decision, but you be brave. Thank you so much. Bless you. Bless you. Awesome. Come on down. Just have an encounter with God. Thank you so much. I know how it feels to take those steps, okay? I did it one time. Make your way over here. If you raised your hand or didn't, this is your moment. Thank you, Lord. This is what I want to do. I want to pray with you guys. We have a few minutes, and I'm going to send you with Pastor Joel in a minute. But I want to pray with you. All these people out here, they want to pray with you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to repeat a prayer together. Repeating the prayer is not magic words. But the Bible says if you do it with honesty in your heart, you will have an encounter with God today. Okay? Let's all repeat with them. Say it after me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, invite I invite you to be my Lord, be my Lord and my Savior. And my Savior. I, ask I ask forgiveness of my sins. Of my sins. The wrongdoings that I've committed against you. Forgive me today. I want you to help me live for you from this day and until eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Awesome. Hey, listen, this is so good. I want to do something, okay? I want to offer you some help, and I want to get some books in your hands. Pastor Joel, an amazing man of God. He's not going to do anything weird, okay? I was pretty weird, eh, but no, he's good. No, he's awesome. He's going to give you some books. He's going to help you out and explain the commitment you made tonight. I don't want you to go back and do the same thing because otherwise the commitment doesn't work. He's going to explain to you how to do that and offer you an SPT. What's that? Spiritual personal training. A person, I recommend that you take it, that will walk you through how to stay firm in God. You want to stay firm in this. You want to keep going, okay? So go with Pastor Joel. He'll give you that, and I'll meet you outside for ice cream and cookies, all right? Take care, man. Awesome. Give him a hand. Come on.